What was Venice Beach before? May 1944, in occupied Belgium. A young girl, age 22, gets arrested because she was doing resistance and bringing fake papers, and gets transferred after four days in cattle train. She arrives in Auschwitz. She is 22 years old. The war is almost over everywhere, but she is, goes there, is in the work camps. Then there's a famous death walk that she goes to another camp, Ravensbrück, and then another camp as the Germans were losing the war. By the time she arrived at the third camp, she was very, very bad. She could hardly move. She weighed 49 pounds. One day, they woke up, and the German had gone, and uh, the Russian came, and the Russian raped them, and then they gone. And then the American came, and uh, they were put in hospital. She weighed 49 pounds, but she went back to Belgium. And uh, her mother fed her little by little, little bit by little bit, every 10 minutes. So she grew like a balloon. And six months later, her fiancé, who was in Switzerland, came back. They met, and they got married. And the doctor told them, you can get married, but you can absolutely not have a child. Because if you have a child, you won't survive, and the child won't be normal. Well, sure enough, nine months later, I was born, and I was not normal. <laughs> And that was the story of my mother. My mother used to say to me, she used to write and tell me, God saved me so that I can give you life. By giving you life, you gave me my life back. You are my torch of freedom. So this is a lot for a little girl. <laughs> and there I was with the torch of freedom. So the three lessons that my mother gave me that are the most valuable to me. One is fear is not an option. So she would actually, if I was afraid of the dark, she would put me in the dark closet and lock me in the dark closet. Today she would probably go to jail. But <laughs> anyway, what happens if you are in a dark closet, first of all, after a few minutes, you realize that it's not dark. It doesn't stay dark. And even if it did, you shouldn't be afraid. So fear is not an option, was something that was really put into me. The other one was, no matter what, you can never be a victim. It doesn't matter. She used to say, I looked at the German in the eyes. And anyway, never be a victim. When they arrived at the camp, she always said that one of the worst things were those cattle train that they were for four days going from Belgium to um, Poland. So she became friendly with a woman who was in her 40s. And she said, no matter what, I will never leave this woman. I will never leave this woman. This woman spoke a little German. So she's just stuck to this woman. When they arrived, they were shaved, and they were put in a long, long line. And there was a soldier who would say, you go right, you go left, you go right, you go left. And then behind this man, in an elevated, something just like about this, there was another man of a, of a higher rank, all dressed in white, and he didn't move. And so when time came to, for the friend of my mother, the soldier said, you go right. And my mother did not wait. She went right following, and the soldier let her do that. This other man, who hadn't moved the entire time, went, took my mother, hit her, I mean, whipped her and threw her on the other side. And she looked at this man with such hate and such hate. And why? Why do you have to do that? She's never hated anybody so much. Well, 
The truth is that this man actually saved her life because the people who were going on the right went to the gas chamber. So the reason I'm telling you that is we all go through a situation that something completely goes wrong and we think it's the worst thing in the world. So maybe it's not. So this is a very dramatic example of it, but it works if a, fr a friend of yours complains. <laughs> so I grew up feeling a little bit like an alien. In Belgium, everybody has blonde, straight hair, and I had little black curly hair. And um, I was born after the war. I, I didn't have a brother, a sibling, until I was six, so I was very much on my own. So um, I had books. I, I loved to read, and I loved to imagine things. I started to write my diary. And I really wonder, will anything ever happen to me? I mean, Belgium is so sad, and it rains all the time. And the more it rains, the more my hair gets curly. And I really did not know what was going to happen. But at that time, really early on, I had a revelation. And my revelation it happened watching myself in the mirror. My mother had a big vanity with a mirror. And I was looking at this mirror. And it's not that I thought I was pretty, because I didn't. But what I liked about this mirror is if I made moves, she would make the same movement. And I could stay hours doing this. The mirror would do this, I would that. <laughs> And that's the day I realized that I actually had control over myself. And it's probably been the most useful thing I've ever had. And that's why I always say the most important relationship in life is the one you have with yourself. Because after that, any other relationship is a plus and not a must. So. Uh, my mother wanted a big life for me, so she put me in boarding school in Switzerland and in England. I, 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 I was starting to live my adventure. I went to university in Geneva, Switzerland, and I met this wonderful, beautiful, good-looking young prince, Egon Furstenberg. And uh, I was dying to be independent. More than anything, I wanted to be independent. I wanted to have my own life design my life, know what I wanted to do. And when you start in life, you don't really know. There's all these doors in front of you. Which, which is going to be your door? And my door happened to be meeting a man who had a factory. And he had a printing factory in Italy. And there he used to be print, um, he used to print scarves for Gucci and Ferragamo and all these places. And there I was just watching him screaming at his workers. He was quite obnoxious, actually. And, but I learned everything. And with the workers in Italy, you learn everything. Because a colorist, their father was a colorist, the, the grandfather was a colorist, so I learned everything about color. And I, Ask the man, please, please, may I make some samples from your factory? I will try to go and sell them in America. And he said, OK. My boyfriend stops to ro in Rome. I go and visit him in Rome. We get engaged. He goes on to Southeast Asia. I go back to the factory. My friend manufacturer drives me from factory to factory. I arrive in Milan. I'm not feeling well. I think it's because he's driving a Maserati. No, I'm pregnant. So I find myself pregnant with this wonderful, attractive, rich man. This was not the way I had planned it. I wanted to be independent. Everybody was going to say, why? This little girl got him because she was pregnant. Long story short, uh, marriage was decided for two months later. And so I made my first collection. I absolutely wanted to be independent. And I came to America. Uh, I came slowly. I decided to come by boat because I wanted to dream about my future life. Of course, I was so nauseous that I dreamed about nothing. <laughs> and and I, I arrived in America. And I, 
I didn't know what I was doing. I had a suitcase full of clothes. I had one baby. 13 months later, I had another baby going back to the fact. I, I took a, a, a hotel suite. I showed my first dresses. I had miserable little orders. I would go back to Italy begging for this man to make me the dresses. And he said, I don't have a sample room. I have a big factory. Please, please, please. And he went on. And then, little by little, um, there was a little wrap top. The little wrap top became a wrap dress. And the wrap dress was born in 1974. And I lived an American dream. It was the most amazing thing. I went to, I mean, I had a great salesman who knew all the stores and he would send me everywhere. I went from store to stores. And I was selling confidence. I was sell, as I was getting confident myself, I was selling confidence. And because what I was selling was a dress, it all made sense. I related to the women. I, it, it was just an incredible uh, adventure. And it was also the um, uh, women's liberation. It was so fun to be a young woman at that time. We were so free. We thought we invented freedom. So, you know, everybody says that I made that dress, but actually that dress made me. And uh, my dream had always been to live a man's life in a woman's body. Yeah. And I did it! Uh, by then, I'm separated from my husband, but in a very, very, very friendly. But I'm feeling free. I am independent. I made a lot of money. I had two children. I was like at the top of the world. I remember one day, and it's a wonderful story. One day, I was because I had small children at home, so when I traveled, I tried to take early plane in the morning. And there I was going to Pittsburgh from New York in an early plane, and. No man, all men, in the, I'm the only woman in the plane. And I'm, you know, kind of cute and uh, wearing a little dress with legs and things. And uh, <laughs> that, that day, I was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And so I had all kinds of pa magazines and newspaper. And on top of it was the Wall Street Journal. And uh, so there's this guy next to me, and mm, he's trying... Well, he's looking, he's trying, how, what, what is he going to say to start a conversation? And then he says to me, why does a girl like you read the, read the Wall Street Journal? So I looked at him and I thought, jerk. And, and, and I say, obviously it was so easy to say, but look, idiot, I am on the front page of the news. <laughs> But I actually decided to say nothing. And that was one of the best, best, best satisfaction I ever had in my life, that I said nothing. Of course, every time I make a speaking engagement, I tell the story. <laughs> All right, but of course, not, not everything goes right. Not everything, and what goes up must go down. After the huge success, I had, you know, everybody in America had one, two, three, five, ten, twenty wrap dresses. And so overnight, it, you know, it kind of sank, and I had to sell my business. Meanwhile, I had started a cosmetic business. And so my children grew up, they went to boarding school. I fall in love with a writer in Paris. I moved to France, and I think fashion business is over for me. And I stay in Paris, and I do a publishing house for five years. Then the love affair is not so great anymore. And my, I miss my children. I miss America. I come back to America. And there I had a really, really hard time, because I realized that what I had done, my work, my brand, at, at the time, you didn't even call it a brand. You, you didn't. Uh, uh, was my identity, and I had lost my identity. And as a matter of fact, within two years, I got a cancer of the tongue, and at the base of the tongue. And I do think that the reason I had that is because I had lost my expression. I couldn't express myself. Anyway, I had to face that, and I did. And uh, I learned how to meditate. I learned what the doctor could do, and I learned what my own power. And uh, that was 23 years ago, so we're good. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. Today I am at, uh, as you're watching me today, I am 70 years old. And, 
Everyone tells me, why you tell everybody you're 70? And I say, I don't understand when some, oh, you're five years old, you're eight already, you're 12, you're 18, and then all of a sudden, nothing? <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, I sh I've lived so fully, I should be 120 years old. So anyway, I am now, at, uh, as I was turning 70 a few months ago, I, 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 I wanted to take time and think what kind of woman I was going to be for my third act. What, how do I stay relevant? And I was doing Tai Chi. I have a very good instructor of Tai Chi. <laughs> and when you do Tai Chi, he said, focus on the intention. And I stopped him and I said, intention. Tell me more about intention. And he said, well, if you focus on, on force, you will fail or break. If you focus on energy, you will stagnate. But if you focus on intention and think about it a lot, you will achieve your goal and your power. So this was a wonderful gift that he gave me. And so as I am today at my age, I decided that I, what I want to do is I want to use my voice, I want to use my experience, I want to use my knowledge, my connection, in order to engage more and more the conversation, especially with women. I have never met a woman who is not strong. All women are strong. But sometimes it's a brother, a religion, a father, or sometimes it's just themselves. Oh, I don't want to make him feel small. Oh, I don't want to do this. We all are like that. But yet, if there is a tragedy, somehow, always, the woman takes over, becomes a lion, and, and saves the situation. So my advice is don't wait for the tragedy to know that you are strong. Work on yourself. Work on that knowledge of your strong. If you know you're strong, you don't always have to show it. But that is very much what I want to spend the rest of my life to do is to capture, to use my voice, to capture voices of other women and weave into a fabric of strength, compassion, and impact to make this world a better world. Thank you.